Happy Friday, everyone. John Lorden here with your weekly episode of Brain Scratch. Thank you so much for joining me here today. Um, I'm going back to a topic, well, kind of touching on a topic that I've covered before, which is the smiley face killer theory. But in today's episode, I want to look specifically at one case that is related to that theory. Now, I've done previous videos about the smiley face killers. If you guys have seen them, you probably know I'm not really a big fan of this theory. I think that um, two retired police officers have somewhat created a boogeyman. I don't know if it's to try to sell books or to get them on television. Um, and I've always said that if they were really interested in proving this, solve one of these cases. And they've got 40 to pick from in terms of their theory, 12 of which only actually have a smiley face involved, but don't, don't get me started on that again. Um, so today we're going to look into a case that I believe should be the most solvable of the smiley face cases, uh, because in this case, we actually have authorities here in the state of Minnesota that believe it could actually be a murder. So today we're looking into the case of Chris Jenkins, but let's go ahead and start just with a brief touch because it's really hard to talk about this case unless you talk about the smiley face aspect. Um, we're starting at the Twin Cities Daily Planet. The smiley face killers, a born in Minneapolis urban legend, takes wing. Two former NYC cops, Kevin Gannon and Anthony Duarte, have spent the past several years chasing after evidence to connect the deaths of several dozen college-age men who have turned up dead in bodies of water across the country, uh, often after leaving parties where they were drinking. Gannon and Duarte not only believe the young men were all murdered, they believe they were murdered by an organized death cult that's operating across the country. And Obviously, that's part of the issue I have with it as well. I mean, they're talking about 11 different states where this is supposedly happening over the course of a decade. Um, I just, I, and there's a big part of the conversation missing in terms of what is the natural occurrence when it comes to men drowning. And if you look into that information, uh, particularly when alcohol is involved, it's significant. About 10 people drown a day, eight of them will be men. So finding the sample set that they've put together to whip this theory up, uh, not difficult at all. Chris Jenkins, a 21-year-old student who left a downtown bar on Halloween night 2002 and whose body was found in the river four months later, is who we're talking about on today's Brain Scratch. And his family has been working very hard. Um, they were kind of working against the police initially. Seems like they got things to kind of take a turn. But as for where it is now, I'm really not sure how helpful um, the, the authorities are being in this case, but we'll, we'll get to that. Um, Jenkins' death was originally ruled an accident, but in 2006, that was changed to homicide reportedly because an MPD detective had heard rumors concerning foul play in the case. So far, Jenkins' death is the only one in Gannon and Duarte's growing case file that is even classified as a homicide. So once again, obviously, if that's true, it should be the one that's closest to being solved. No one, as far as I can tell, has claimed that a smiley face turned up anywhere in conjunction with Chris Jenkins' death. So uh, despite the fact that the two detectives have rolled it into their theory, we don't actually have a smiley face seemingly related to this case. Uh, the FBI issued this statement. Over the past several years, law enforcement and the FBI have received information about young, college-aged men who were found deceased in rivers in the Midwest. To date, we have not developed any evidence to support links between those tragic deaths or any evidence substantiating the theory that these deaths are the work of a serial killer or killers. The vast majority of these instances appear to be alcohol-related drownings. And if you're a fan of Brain Scratch Searchlight, you'll know that uh, this year... I think we've had two cases that fall into that that aren't even in the US. This is a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, in the UK, there's also kind of a boogeyman theory that's been wrapped up in this as well, known as the pusher. Uh, and that one is a bit harder to at least debate with people because it seems like in one case, someone survived and they actually were, were pushed into a canal. But for all the other cases where the people haven't survived, um, it's really tough to come to the conclusion that there's someone that's doing this because part of these theories is 
the murderer is somehow putting these guys in the water without leaving any marks on them. No struggle. They're somehow possibly drugging them, putting them in the water. That's kind of the most popular variant of theory. So this is the last photograph of Chris with a few people at a Halloween party. Um, we can see he's obviously dressed up as a Native American. And it's... Um, I don't know, it's it's a really, really tough case in particular because of when we talk about some of the logistics about how he's found, it's really probably one of the most difficult cases in terms of trying to figure out what was really the cause of death or at least where he was when he died, how his body was found in the position that it was found in. That's really where this case just hits some major, major stopping points. Um, now, he would eventually be found in the Mississippi River. Let's just do a little touch on the Mississippi. Uh, it is the chief river of the of the second largest drainage system on the North American continent. The stream is entirely within the United States and it flows generally south for 2,320 miles. The Mississippi ranks as the fourth longest and the 15th largest river by discharge in the world. And you can see a picture of it there and it is quite beautiful. I've, I've been to it a few times here in Minnesota. Um, you can really take in some some very pretty scenery around it all throughout the year. Um, so let's look at some photos here of Chris. This is from NBCNews.com. First picture here is him celebrating the birthday of a friend of his. Um, we can see a picture here. He was a lacrosse goalie and a three-time captain. After his death, the university created an invitational game in his honor. Um, and we can see he's he's in pretty good shape here. We can see he's got he's got some muscle on him. So once again, thinking of this theory where someone is overpowering him or overcoming him in some way and not leaving a mark on him when you're talking about a guy this strong uh, really raises a big question for me. Here's a photo from 1991. Uh, Steve Jenkins coached Chris's baseball team every year that Chris played, and his teammates called him Dirt because he loved stealing bases. Um, by all reports, seems like just a very likable guy. There's not a lot that I've bumped into um, that doesn't support that information. And here we have a picture of him with his mother, Jan. Um, who has been working very hard, and both her and his father have really been contributing in terms of media. There's a few things that we'll talk about by the time I get to the, the end of this video, where if you want to learn more or you want to see what they have to say about this case, I'll have some links for you in the description box down below. Uh, but let's get started. This is a blog that has kind of been writing about this case uh, for a few um, for, for many years, but in a few specific instances. It's called Footprints at the River's Edge. And we can see this case happens on October uh, 31st, 2002. After a 6 p.m. keg party at his home, Chris Jenkins, his girlfriend Ashley Rice, and a few friends headed over to the Lone Tree Bar and Grill at 528 Hennepin Avenue in downtown Minneapolis. The group arrived at the bar between 10.30 and 11 p.m. and parked the car just south of the bar. Sometime around midnight, Chris Jenkins was reportedly kicked out of the bar. Um, now, in just about every other instance of the telling of this story, that's what you're going to hear. And there's basically a story that he spilled his drink on himself. Uh, one of the bouncers, who happens to be an off-duty police officer, saw the spill, thought he had urinated himself, and they kicked him out of the bar. Um, however, in one of the latest pieces of media that has been created on this, and that's a TV show right here called Breaking Homicide, and the particular episode is, it's season one, episode three, it's called Secrets of the River. You can rent it on YouTube for a dollar, as low as $1.99 here in the US. But um, on this particular episode, the research that they've done, they actually interview one of the guys that was working at the bar, and he says that Chris was not kicked out of the bar at all, that Chris came outside on his own, and someone had made a comment that it looked like he urinated himself because they saw the stain, and it seemed to kind of rattle Chris, and he walked off and around the corner, basically out of view around the block. So a little bit of a discrepancy there, but in most of the retellings of this story, you're going to hear that he actually got ejected from the bar and that he did not have his jacket, 
his wallet, his cell phone. So witnesses said the head of Lone Tree Security instructed staff not to allow Chris back into the bar despite the 20 degree weather outside. Wearing only his American Indian costume, a brown nylon shirt and pants, slip on shoes and a headband with a red feather, he was put out on the street. He did not have a coat and his wallet, cell phone and keys were inside with his friends. Now, I have bumped into information that supports that his wallet was indeed inside. I think his girlfriend had it in her purse. Uh, I believe she also had his cell phone or another friend had a cell phone because his outfit didn't have any pockets. I'm not sure about the keys. Um, I don't I don't have a lot of information about where his keys were, but he essentially lived just across a bridge. He could have he could have likely walked home. Um, but why would he leave all that stuff behind? It's certainly a question. Uh, of course, if he was kicked out and they weren't going to let him back in, perhaps he had no choice, but wouldn't he possibly hang around outside, wait for one of his friends to figure out, you know, hey, where's Chris? Someone go out front and try to find him. He was there with, uh, I believe in the car, there was at least four people, possibly five people in the vehicle. So, uh, and it was a girlfriend, his girlfriend was one of them, and then another couple that they were friends with. So you would think that there's a lot of people that should care enough about this guy that they would go outside and notice that he's been missing and, and possibly try to find him. However, that would be the last time he was seen alive. After little progress was made by local authorities in finding their son, Jan and Steve Jenkins decided to take matters into their own hands. A possible tip indicated that Chris may have been spotted walking north across the Hennepin Avenue Bridge over the Mississippi River. And that would make sense if he was heading home. That's basically the direction he should be going. There's a few bridges that he could use. There might be other bridges that are kind of more lined up with where his home is, but that's a main bridge, certainly a possibility that he could have made that walk on that bridge. However, quote, there were two surveillance cameras on the Federal Reserve Bank pointing to the Hennepin Avenue Bridge, says Jan. We have written documentation from the supervisor that more than one person viewed the tapes from both cameras late on the 31st and early on November 1st. Chris was not seen on the tape. We do not believe Chris walked across that bridge. The supervisor told the FBI that it would be almost impossible for a person to sprint across that bridge and not be seen. Uh, and then the family hires private investigator Chuck Loesch. Now, I always have to take these things with a grain of salt when I hear stuff like this. We do not have the authorities going to the Federal Reserve Bank, asking them for those materials, pulling them back, and then having their team review it. We essentially have the Federal Reserve Bank learning about this case somehow. I'm not sure if it came through the authorities or if the family went and spoke to them directly saying, okay, you know, we'll check it out. We're going to put a couple of employees on it. And then hearing back from those employees, no, we didn't see him. Uh, now they're saying that they have really good equipment and that, you know, it's a Federal Reserve Bank. So obviously they're going to probably have some of the best cameras you can get. However, and yes, they are located right next to where the bridge starts, but it's a really long bridge. I don't know, guys, I don't feel great about a sign off that there's no way that he could have walked across that bridge. And there's also an island that's about halfway across that bridge. And you can actually take a little bit of an off ramp off the bridge to get down to that island. So um, there's, there's a few things just about this videotape review that kind of bother me. I can tell you from the family's perspective, they are just absolutely convinced there's, there's no way that he went across that bridge at all. Now, the private investigator, Chuck, um, actually released his notes to NBC News, and I have read through all of them. They are heavily redacted and in a way where it makes it very difficult to read. They've basically X'd out everyone's names, but they didn't code the names. So just anywhere a name happens that they didn't want to show, they just literally X'd it all out. So it's kind of hard to follow the flow of conversation and to say, wait, is he talking about the same person he was talking about in the last sen sentence? Or is he talking about someone that was the X's up at the top of this paragraph? However, there's some information I was able to get from it. Uh, we can see this is dated November 7th of 2002. Met with Sarah, who is Chris's sister, uh, and Bloodhound Handler, and then the name has been redacted. 
8.40 a.m., Sarah went to the rear of Holiday Inn to get her vehicle. The driver's side front side window had been broken and Chris's cell phone had been stolen out of it. Uh, I just, it's a really tough break. I mean, his cell phone, I don't know that it would have been super valuable because we know that he didn't have his cell phone with him when he went off. Um, but could there have been some research done on that cell phone that might have helped in terms of the investigation? I think there's a possibility of it. It's just a real shame that the, the cell phone is stolen. Uh, of course, there are always the records to look to as well, just to see who he was communicating with that day. Is it possible that he was going to meet up with someone, which is a possibility that I actually bumped into thanks to the investigator's notes here that quite honestly, no one else talks about. So let's just take a minute to cover that. Based on what I'm seeing from this investigator's notes, Chris um, could s certainly enjoy drinking, but also on occasion enjoyed smoking marijuana. And there is there are particular notes in here from a friend of his where it seems like Chris may have been trying to meet up with someone to get some pot on this night. So uh, I don't know if that's tied to this case at all. I have seen that mentioned nowhere except for in the investigator notes here. So none of the other coverage that I've seen has anyone even you know checked that out, gone down that that rabbit hole. Um, but I just wanted to mention it because when you're you're thinking about him being outside, even if he's leaving on his own, and then he just goes down the street leaving his wallet, his cell phone behind. Now, it doesn't make a lot of sense if he left his wallet behind because you're thinking he's probably going to need money, um, but maybe he thinks that his dealer is going to be able to front him for it or something. I don't know. Um, but it does seem like he was intending on coming back if he left those items back at the bar. So uh, the thought that maybe he was going to meet up with someone that was local to that area to potentially uh, you know, get some marijuana, I think we do have to kind of keep that in mind as we roll, roll forward on this. So back to uh, November 7th of 2002, uh, at 9 a.m., a search was initiated starting in front of the Lone Tree Bar utilizing the Bloodhound. A no-hit was assumed at that starting point. We continued the search directly in front of Times Square Pizza and Subs. The Bloodhound seemed to pick up a scent, which subsequently brought all of us into the indoor parking facility immediately north of Times Square. The dog circled the rather small main floor of the parking facility, then went down a ramp into the lower level. The bloodhound went to stall number 90, then 89, and had what its handler stated as a solid hit. So this is something you will certainly hear about uh, in a lot of reviews of this story. Uh, and that's not the only one. There was two bloodhounds that basically did the same thing, went to the same location. The, the fact that um, they're picking up his trail in front of the Times Square pizza and subs is a bit interesting because according to people that the investigator spoke to, um, there was some kind of jumping that happened that night where it looked like 10 men attacked someone. So they're trying to, I think they're trying to piece together, could that have possibly possibly been Chris that was attacked and was he taken from that position. Um, but as we're going to find out when his body is discovered, there's there's no marks of any trauma to him. So it, it's practically impossible that it was him that was being jumped at that particular time. Uh, we crossed Hennepin and proceeded to walk towards the Hennepin Avenue Bridge. Beneath the north end of the Hennepin Avenue Bridge, the Bloodhound went to and into the river directly below the bridge. The handler felt that might indicate another hit. We walked north on the river's edge, which proved unremarkable except for bedding and clothing located underneath the grain belt sign just past the west side of the bridge. So I know I'm giving you guys all these locations and they're not probably making a lot of sense. Let's take a look here. So this is the Hennepin Bridge. Here we can see the Mississippi River running down here. And the bar, it uh, looks like I lost my marker for it, but the bar is about five blocks away from the bridge. So uh, I'd say it's somewhere, somewhere around here. Um, now they're saying that he walked, actually it would be a little further back because they're saying he made a left on 5th. So here's Hennepin and 5th. So that is where the bar is. That's where all this starts. Now, the hit that they're talking about happens way over here. 
The grain belt sign that they're mentioning that the bedding was found under is over here. It's actually on Nicolette Island. Now, the way he describes it, I think the hit that they're talking about that he said was under the bridge is somewhere around here that the dogs hit. At least that's the best I can get from his description. He's kind of picking some strange directions in terms of how he's describing it. But they decide to walk north along the water, and that's where they bump into, um, I would imagine it's probably bedding for a homeless person and some clothing and stuff like that that's there. Uh, but keep that in mind. That might actually come into play as we're talking more about the position that he's found in. And there's another section. There's a lot of notes in here, and unfortunately, they're not dated properly. They kind of go back and forth in terms of time. Uh, just to learn a little bit more, uh, Chris was a captain of the lacrosse team at his university. He was known as a jokester, a clown, smart, athletic, loyal to friends, uh, drinks, might get offensive if drinking, stand-up type of guy, would not cower away from a confrontation, student at U of M senior, might use pot, lives in house on campus. He was intoxicated while in the uh, bar. He may have been mad or confronted by some cowboy in the bar. Now, that uh, TV show that I told you about actually talks about a situation where it seems like two guys were getting into an argument in the bar and Chris kind of broke it up, kind of got between them and, and tried to get them to, to settle down. Uh, I did also hear a story from his family where uh, he was basically not liking how someone was treating a, a, a girl that he was going to school with and he um, grabbed them by the collars and kind of put them up against the wall and told them to you know treat her differently. So... It's another weird thing that doesn't quite come across, but I'm just getting hints of it. Uh, and you know, the PI is saying it pretty directly here, would not cower away from a confrontation and might get offensive if drinking. I think that, um, not that he's trying to be some kind of tough guy or something like that, but if a situation popped up and he thought that he might have to get physical, I don't think he'd be the type of guy to shy away from it. He was also the goalie for his lacrosse team and uh, they had a friend of his interviewed and the friend was basically saying, you know, the word within lacrosse is that if you're a goalie, you're, you're, you're kind of out there because you're basically just taking shots, just ball after ball after ball coming at you. So um, there might be a little bit of an edge in Chris that is not coming across in hindsight because of the type of coverage that we're seeing now. But I just wanted to share that guys with you, uh, that with you guys as well. While at the Lone Tree, someone held on to Chris's wallet as Chris didn't have any pockets on his costume. And then they basically note the last time that he was seen from, I believe this is each of the friends that he was there with. So one of them last saw him at 11.30, someone else at 12.15, someone else at 12.30, and then someone at 12.40. Uh, and they're saying that that is the person that was actually the driver of the car that got them all there. Unfortunately, four months later, Chris's body was found on the east side of the Mississippi River near the spillway of the St. Anthony Falls. And if we go back to the map here, um, you can see we've got this kind of area right here uh, where the there's, there's a bit of a dam and then there's some falls here. St. Anthony Falls are right here. Uh, he was found on the east side. So... This is another interesting point because the private investigator talks about his location as being kind of over here, kind of close to where the uh, break for the falls starts. However, in that television show, uh, Breaking Homicide, when they went there and interviewed the person that actually saw him and called it in, she says when she saw him that he was originally on the other side, and I believe it's of this little turnout here that they were standing on, that he was actually over here somewhere. Uh, and there was a tree that he was kind of stuck on, and I believe he's actually frozen to. Half of his body is frozen at the time that he is seen here, um, but by the time the authorities get there, and from what the private investigator hears, they're recovering him from over here. And um, the hosts of that show said that it was about 100 yards difference. So within a couple hours, it looks like uh, he traveled uh, quite a bit and might have been even less than a few hours. 
Chris was also an honor student at U of M's prestigious Carlson School of Management. He was gearing up to graduate and he had job interviews lined up. He was happy, easygoing, and he had plans for the future. The medical examiner initially ruled the death an accidental drowning. Uh, and they're basically saying this because it seems like one of the assumptions that the investigators took right off the bat was, uh, was there some possibility that Chris had ended his own life? And it doesn't seem like it. We, we see what appears to be a bright future. Uh, he's going out with friends. None of his friends are noting that there's any kind of emotional issues or anything like that going on. The Jenkins family consulted with global experts in water rescue and recovery and renowned forensic pathologist, Dr. Michael Baden, uh, due to a natural reaction to try to swim, most drowning victims are found face down, arms out toward their sides, clothing disheveled, and one or both of their shoes missing. Chris was found on his back with his arms crossed in front. His shirt was still tucked into its drawstring pants. He was also still wearing both oversized slip-on shoes, a necklace, and a ring on each hand. Now, how his hands were crossed really varies um, depending on who you have demonstrating it. A lot of people are saying it was almost like an Egyptian mummy, like they're crossed near up here. But I've seen enough photos that uh, they are crossed, not crossed, I wouldn't say crossed. His hands seem like they're right next to each other, close to his chest and low. And a lot of people are assuming that they, that his body was manipulated, that he was basically put into that position. Um, I don't know that that would be my initial assumption. What it looks like to me, keeping in mind he's out there in 20 degree weather, is he might be trying to keep himself warm. It seems like the most natural position. I know in previous videos I've talked about that if I was in a freezing situation, the first thing I'm gonna do is probably, you know, roll my hands into my t-shirt and, and try to keep them warm. And my hands go right to the position, basically, that his hands were found in. So it's strange, because in the coverage, you know, you're gonna hear a lot of people that are like, whoever killed him, put him in this position. But you still have to consider the fact that he's found in this position. Four months later, he's floating on his back. His arms are crossed in front. We've got all these strange things about his clothing just being completely intact. Um, so what that does is takes a whole bunch of theories about him jumping off bridges, being thrown over bridges, all that kind of stuff just goes right out the window. Um, and even the fact that he was in the water for his shoes to still be on when they're oversized, slip on. I mean, these are, these are costume shoes. And if you've ever worn those types of Halloween costumes, they usually don't fit great. They're made of really thin fabric. To hear that he's still clothed and the top is still tucked in on that costume, um, I don't know. It's just, it really, it really boggles my mind. Um, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm wondering about that top being tucked in because in this photo, I don't think it's tucked in. I think he's wearing it outside of the pants. Could that potentially be another indicator? Let me, let me show you guys what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, in this photo, I don't believe that that top is tucked into the pants. I think that could be potentially another indicator that he might have been cold. Maybe he thought that if he would tuck his shirt in, it would stop the cold air from kind of going up through there. Um, yeah, very, very strange. But obviously with the shoes, with the fact that there was no injuries found, him taking the type of fall that they're suggesting from the Hennepin Bridge, uh, just not likely, not likely at all. Now, unfortunately, I haven't been able to find a link to the actual autopsy report. I understand it's six pages long. I did see some analysis that was done by one of the two guys that came up with the smiley face killer theory. And quite honestly, um, I just believe that they're so biased, I really can't look at their analysis and, and take it objectively. Um, the only note I could really find is here at the Brainerd Dispatch, and they're noting that the manner of death was undetermined. I believe the cause of death 
has been noted as drowning. I've seen it referred to in a couple of articles, but I would really like to see that for myself. If you guys uh, bump into any links for the actual autopsy report for Chris's case, please leave a link to that in the description box or in the uh, comment boxes below so that we can check that out. Because I do think there would be some value to seeing uh, what the autopsy determined. So just with the pieces we've talked about so far, I'm, I'm wondering, and it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but I'm wondering if Chris may have laid down somewhere and he was trying to keep himself warm. You know, the other thing about having your hands like that, it almost suggests that you could have been bundling up. Like if you had a blanket wrapped around you or something, you bring your fists together to kind of keep it wrapped around you. Uh, and keep in mind, we do have them bumping into what seems like bedding that was over uh, on Nicolette Island that is certainly in the water path of where he eventually winds up. Um, I don't know. There's just something about that. It kind of reminds me of the Corey McKeague case a little bit. You know, a lot of people are under the assumption that Corey uh, went to sleep in one of those bins and the bin was picked up by the lorry. So uh, is that a similar thing to what we have going on here? Did he decide halfway on his way home? Maybe he wasn't feeling good. Maybe he had a little too much to drink. Maybe that was enough to try to get him to stop somewhere where he just wanted to lay down for a little bit. He saw the bedding over there halfway across the bridge. Um, I don't know. I know it doesn't sound super logical, especially because you would think he wouldn't want to be close to water. I mean, you, you get close to the Mississippi when it's cold out here, you feel it. You know, the wind comes across. Basically, it's like a, a giant air conditioner and just it it gets frigid. It gets really, really cold there. Um, so I don't know, guys. It's I'm not saying that that's really what's going on here. I'm just telling you guys that's where my brain is Where when I'm hearing these pieces and looking at this case in this way. Uh, over at nprnews.org, Minneapolis police apologize, say student's death a homicide. And this was November 21st, 2006. Minneapolis police chief Dolan is quoted here. We made an assumption. And because of that assumption, we probably caused pain. Well, I know we caused pain in the Jenkins family. For the Minneapolis Police Department, I want to apologize. Now, it is, I think it's just important to note that um, Chief Dolan, I don't believe he was the chief at the time that this happened. I think he came in after that. Um, so he's apologizing for missteps that happened. Uh, I think he's he's a, a good man for doing so. But we also have some information about him that I want to share with you guys later. Well, more about his point of view on this case where maybe it's not exactly as cut and dry as, as we're hearing in this article. After a couple years, the police were back on the case. Uh, Sergeant Pete Jackson says he returned to it after receiving a tip last year. A source brought me a rumor, Jackson said. It was about 10th hand. And at that point, I decided I needed to just kind of go and take a look at this because prior to that, we really had no idea really how Chris ended up in the river. Police are talking to a man he described as an eyewitness slash suspect. Jackson says the man is incarcerated for a separate crime. He says the man has knowledge of the crime scene, including its location, but his role in Jenkins' death is not clear. This person has given me very specific details of the exact spot where Christopher Jenkins was thrown off of a bridge. I'll just leave it at that, Jackson said. Now... I'm a little curious at that statement because um, by all the analysis I've seen by many other people that have been reviewing this case as well, uh, it doesn't make sense that he was thrown off that bridge. That bridge has all kinds of problems with throwing someone off of it. First of all, there's a guardrail that goes. The guardrail looks like it runs between four and a half feet, possibly as, as high as five feet tall. Uh, so could you do it as as one person? Probably not. Could two people do it? Maybe. But then even if you get them over that guardrail, there is this big giant steel rail outside of that that still goes about another five feet wide. Um, and if someone did, even if you could get them up over the guardrail and they would tumble off of that secondary railing, I'm pretty sure they would injure themselves in some way. You'd probably notice something on their body. Then you've got the fall all the way to the water. I'm sure their clothing is going to become disheveled. Their shoes are probably going to come off. The necklace would at least, you would think, possibly get damaged or come off. Um, so I don't know why hearing details of him being thrown off a bridge would necessarily change the police's perspective on this. 
I would like to think there were other details that were given to them by this person that might have helped them with that decision. Uh, and once again, thanks to the TV show Breaking Homicide, which just aired this year about this case, we know who they're talking about. They're talking about a man, I, I have an article here at the dispatch, a man accused of murder said he killed a suburban Minneapolis man in self-defense after a night of drinking and arguing. Jeremy Alford, 22, was charged with the November 3rd slaying of his former roommate, Douglas Miller. So Jeremy Alford is supposedly this source for this information. Uh, let's go ahead and continue here so we can get a little bit of an idea about what type of crime he did. Uh, yeah, I, be, I feel bad about it, Jeremy Alford told the Gazette in a jailhouse interview. I feel sorry for him, but it wasn't my intent to kill him, just beat him. Miller's body was found inside his burned mobile home with up to 20 stab wounds on the front and back of his body and a blunt force blow to his head. Investigators have said the brothers confessed to the killings, but Jeremy Alford is taking full credit. Yeah, his brother was also involved in this attack against this man. Um, now, one of the things that they brought up on Breaking Homicide is the MO of this crime just doesn't seem to match. These are guys that went into a rage and attacked this poor guy, uh, stabbed him over 20 times with all kinds of different instruments, and then you know lit the house on fire. How you go from that to they had some type of altercation with Chris, but drugged him or knocked him out in some way where they didn't leave a mark on his body and then supposedly threw him off a bridge, once again, not leaving a mark on his body, leaving all his clothing perfectly intact. And then he winds up in a perfect pose, floating on his back with his hands together. It just, it's not logical. It doesn't make sense. Do I think this guy is involved? Um, based on the information that I can only read from what's publicly available here, I don't think so. I, I don't think that he's involved with this. Um, does that rule out that someone is involved? Not necessarily. And one of the more interesting aspects of uh, Breaking Homicide, they talk to uh, Cyril Wecht, who you might know, he's a forensic pathologist, kind of comes up on television a lot uh, as an expert for these types of cases. And he raised the point that um, you could potentially have someone struck in the head, particularly if they have thick hair, and it doesn't actually leave a mark, but it's still enough of a blow to knock them out. Um, do we have something like that potentially going on here? Possibly. But if that's possible, if you could strike someone on the head in that way, uh, isn't it also possible that there could be a natural accident, that there could have been a slip and he hit his head like that? Um, but then once again, you've got the, the position of the arms. How does he wind up in that position um, found four months later? It's just, it's, there's a lot to this case that just defies logic. Even when you look at it in both directions, it's really tough to come to a conclusion. Now, it does seem like they actually tried to run charges against this Jeremy guy uh, over at Twin Cities Pioneer Press, July 31st, 2007. The Hennepin County Attorney's Office said Tuesday it won't bring charges in the death of Chris Jenkins. The case has been returned to the Minneapolis Police Department. A statement from the county attorney's office said it remains under investigation. His parents remain critical of the way the case was handled. A police officer was involved with getting Chris kicked out of the bar day one, and he has never been questioned by the Minneapolis Police Department. We have a problem with that. Anybody in that bar has not been questioned. We have a problem with that. The people that went to the bar with Chris were never interviewed. We have a problem with that, said Jenkins' father, Steve Jenkins. The police department said homicide unit investigators will continue in their efforts to bring Chris Jenkins' killer to justice. Police spokeswoman Lieutenant Amelia Huffman said her department still has a suspect in the case. However, that suspect is not in custody. Now, that's pretty interesting. So outside of Jeremy Alford, it seems like there is someone else that is actually being considered a suspect here. That's literally the only note that I've seen about it. So I have no idea um, who that person is or what are the conditions for them being considered a suspect. Getting cases back from the county's attorney's office is relatively common, she added. It's important to know that homicide cases remain open until they're resolved, she said. The county attorney's announcement came the same day the Hennepin County Medical Examiner updated Jenkins' manner of death from undetermined to homicide. Now, 
I'm not saying that I'm against them pointing in this direction and treating this like a homicide. I think that it's I think it fits for this case. I think there's there's so many questions, particularly about how his body is found, that it, it has to be looked at in that way. And it should have been looked into that way right from the start. But this last twist about the medical examiner changing the manner of death, I really don't understand that. I don't know how you look at a report that was written five years prior and then say, oh, you know what? No, we're going to change that. And I don't know what the benefit of that is. Um, does that truly help the family? I don't think so, because you've already got the police investigating this as, as if there's a potential homicide going on. We've already heard you basically have at least two suspects that have been considered in this. So I, I just, I don't know. I don't know what the cause of the medical examiner doing that is. I don't know if there was new information that came in or something along those lines. I would like to hope that it was triggered by something and it wasn't just you know, some some new management came in and said, oh, let me look at this again. Now we need to change that, flip that to, to homicide. Um, I would like to think that the autopsy pro process is a scientific process, but as we've talked about on this channel time and time again, it does certainly get influenced by the investigation um, in some cases. I just, I wish that it was a purely scientific process. It, it just doesn't seem like it is. Over at swnewsmedia.com, an episode of Breaking Homicide airing this weekend on Investigation Discovery is attempting to shed new light on the case. The episode is called Secrets of the River. Uh, and Jan said they were approached last fall about doing Breaking Homicide. The taping occurred in October of 2017. Jan said they decided to put the story out there for all the lives that are yet to be taken. She added she hasn't had contact with the Minneapolis Police Department about the case since around 2010. I found that really heartbreaking uh, to think of everything that this family has gone through to get from 2002 to 2006, where they're finally able to get this looked at too properly. And I'm not saying that I believe this is a homicide or that I don't. I'm just saying that it should have been investigated differently. They finally got it to that point of it being investigated differently. And then that goes on for a few years, but then communication just completely breaks and it's now been eight years. Um, I don't know. There, that, that really, really breaks my heart. Someone, maybe someone will come forward. There's always that chance. People's conscience does play on them, she said. Uh, and I do have contact information in the description box below. If you happen to have some information about this case that you think can help, please, please get that information in. Um, there's a lot of different theories out there. There's a theory that Perhaps uh, he just went for a ride with people he knew or people he didn't know, that they went to Nicolette Island. There's apparently some kind of caves out there called Satan's Caves or something. They, they go into this a bit with Breaking Homicide. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on several of the main theories that Breaking Homicide covered just so I can tell you guys about the most recent thoughts on this case. Um, the Devil's Caves thing, I didn't find particularly compelling because it looks like the type of place where teenagers would go to party. There's beer cans all over the place. There's graffiti all over the walls. It doesn't seem to me like anyone old enough to get into an actual bar is going to go to a place like that. It seems like it's more of a place for kids to get away with doing stuff they're not supposed to be doing. So, you know, 16-year-olds that want to drink beer, I'm pretty sure that's the type of place they go to. I don't think that's the type of scene that someone like this, kind of all-American, athletic, good student, I just, I don't think that that's the type of spot he's going to go to. Um, but they did touch on the GHB theory as well. And I've talked about this a little bit in previous episodes, but let me just touch on it again so everyone's up to date. Uh, GHB is a naturally occurring neurotransmitter and a psychoactive drug. And that's really important to remember is that it does naturally occur in your body. Um, there are so many cases where I see people will read an autopsy report and they're like, oh my God, look, there's a GHB level. In most cases, there should be. It, it naturally occurs in our body and the amount can actually increase as we decompose. Uh, GHB is also produced as a result of fermentation. So obviously, once we start decomposing, uh, there could be more GHB that's created. The only common medical use for GHB today uh, is in the treatment of narcolepsy and more rarely alcoholism. 
Uh, for recreational use, GHB is a central nervous system depressant used as an intoxicant. At higher doses, GHB may induce nausea, dizziness, drowsiness, agitation, visual disturbances, depressed breathing, amnesia, unconsciousness, and death. The effects of GHB can last from one and a half to four hours or longer if large doses have been consumed. Consuming GHB with alcohol can cause respiratory arrest and vomiting in combination with unrousable sleep, which is a potentially lethal combination. In terms of party use, GHB has been used as a club drug, apparently starting in the 1990s. Slang terms are liquid ecstasy, lollipops, liquid X, or liquid E. But by 2009, this use has diminished, and the downward trend is still apparent in 2012. Uh, they believe that might be possibly due to um, people having bad experiences with it because it's kind of hard to take the perfect amount for having a good experience with it. Uh, used as a date rape drug, GHB became known to the general public as a date rape drug by the late 1990s. It's colorless and odorless and has been described as very easy to add to drinks. However, a 2006 study suggested there was no evidence to suggest widespread date rape drug use in the UK and less than 2% of cases involved GHB. A survey in the Netherlands published in 2010 found that the proportion of drug-related rape where GHB was used appeared to be greatly overestimated by the media. And I can tell you guys, just being in this type of work that I'm in, uh, GHB comes up as the answer to all kinds of these mysteries. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it's a big component to the smiley face killer mystery. Uh, I believe that the two detectives that created that theory think that GHB is the answer because you're finding all these people that don't have any marks on them. Um, so it's obvious that they've been drugged in some way. Now, they did find a GHB level for Chris. Uh, Dr. Cyril Wecht on the, um, uh, on the Breaking Homicide show addressed that. He said that for the amount that he saw, he did not believe that it was GHB that was given to Chris, that that was a naturally occurring amount that was found in his body. Uh, I have no idea if it could have dissipated. I mean, we're talking four months later. But also keep in mind, uh, Chris's body was pretty well preserved. It seems like um, it seems like he must have died somewhere very close to where he was able to get um, frosted over very quickly. Because uh, you know, I've, I've seen I've seen a lot of photos uh, doing this type of work, and I can tell you, he did not he did not look like he was out there for four months, even in the water for four months. He really looked like. Um, he was frozen somewhere. And we know that at least half of his body was frozen at the time they found him. So I think it's, I think it's pretty likely that there's a good chance he was frozen somewhere. Might also explain why they weren't able to find him. Um, you know, right around that time of year, late October to early November, um, that's when we usually kind of get our first big snow. Now, uh, this year is kind of weird. We've already had one just about a week ago. Um, but that first big snow, usually it's not like everything gets frozen. The ground doesn't get frozen. The, the snow doesn't even stick around. You know, I think it snowed for like probably six or seven hours last weekend. And within two hours of it stopping, everything had pretty much melted off. So, um, I don't think that, uh, the lake or the Mississippi would have been completely frozen over at that point. I have heard people say that in 1999 in particular, I think there was a really crazy storm that happened out here and things got particularly cold. But just based on my few years of being out here, that time of year, yeah, you're starting to get a little snowfall, but it's not like everything's freezing over. Um, but as you get into November, things change really, really rapidly. And all of a sudden you might get numerous days, you might get a lot more uh, cold weather that's coming in. So there seems to be some aspect to him being preserved here. Now, if you were talking to the two detectives with the smiley face theory, um, they might say something like, well, it's obvious that he was pulled out of the water. Someone put him in a freezer somewhere in their house or something like that, then brought him back to the same location where he was last seen four months later for some reason. I don't know. I don't know. It, it's, it's, not, it's not super logical to me that he would have been removed, taken to some other place, hidden for that long for some reason, and then returned 
to that particular area. I just don't, I don't know what the benefit of it would be. Um, I mean, if you're going to be able to hide a body for four months somewhere, why are you going to move it after that? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm really struggling with this one, guys. It's, it's tough because, like I said, I think it's the closest of these. And I think all of these 40 cases should be looked at individually um, and treated individually. And thankfully, I think at some level, they probably are in terms of there at least being you know, local police departments that are responsible for these cases. But with the assumption that these are naturally occurring deaths, I'm worried that there is a real murder in one of these cases. And I feel like Chris's is the closest that we have to that actual occurrence. Um, so what else did, did, what else was covered in breaking homicide? Let me uh, punch forward here. So here's just a quick shot of Satan's cave. Um, now I looked, I really couldn't find where the entrances for it are. And their theory was that he came here for a party. He was partying. He decided he had to go urinate. So he got up went out topside, got close to the water and slipped in or something along those lines. Um, this map is kind of upside down compared to the last map that we looked at. So the bridge is actually over here. That grain belt sign would be right about here. And he is ultimately found over here. Um, what is interesting about this is this waterway does look like it would lead to about where um, his body would first be sighted, which is somewhere right about here. However, there might be strange currents that are going on over here based on some information that we learn once again from the private investigator's notes. This is from June 9th, 2003. Uh, he drove to the Mississippi River area, drove to the Excel site where he met with an employee. Uh, he explained that when the four Excel turbines are on, Anything in the river north of the dam would be sucked into this area. He said a search of records would reveal if the turbines were on when Chris's body was found. He also said, based on his experience, that objects flowing in the backwater or underneath the iron bridge would most certainly end up by the power plant and not by the dam. So um, basically, we can see the, the power park is right here. And I would imagine that the turbines, I don't know if they're directly under it or if they're kind of placed in the water forward, but essentially they would be sucking it through into here. And you could see that would create kind of a wash that is all going to pull into this area. And that is certainly where he was found. He's originally spotted over here somewhere, eventually pulled out when he's over here somewhere. So I don't know if there was an instance where the turbines were on for a certain amount of time that day and that could have pulled him to this spot. Um, but I'm also not clear that it rules out that he could have come from the west side of the river either. Even if you look at the satellite view, there's kind of this trace of the currents that you can see drawn around. I don't know if these are, um, I don't know if these are posts or what these are that are in the water here. But you can see there seems to be a drag if these are truly currents uh, leading into that direction. And if there are four turbines over here, it would make sense that there's probably some suction that's happening in this direction. So. I don't know that it completely rules out him coming from the west side, but you know, definitely the easiest thing to believe would be that he was coming from this side. And just to be clear, uh, he lives somewhere up over here uh, on campus, way off up in the right. So that's also why I'm wondering, would he have necessarily used the Hennepin Bridge? Uh, if he did use it, could he have only used it halfway? Because then he could have dropped down to this other uh, iron bridge on Merriam Street. Or could he have even possibly come all the way down to 3rd Street to try to cross to go there? But with where, where his body's located, um, it's definitely suggesting that he was north of where he was found. Um, you know, water isn't going to flow the other direction necessarily, but you are talking about industrial equipment being in that area. Could it be doing something funky with the water flow? I just don't know enough about it. So where has this all gone? A uh, strange case of son's death propels mom on tireless quest. It's now the subject of a book written by his mother, Jan. Jan Jenkins has published a book that reveals not only the excruciating pain their family suffered, but also some shocking details of how police handled or mishandled the death. Their quest also included psychics and pseudoscientists who no doubt irked those on the case. Uh, that was another aspect of the private investigator's notes that was 
uh, I don't know, just particularly bothered me. Um, he was with them when a psychic was being used. And uh, basically, if you read through that whole chain, you have him thinking there might be something to the psychic. Then when they're starting to get the details, he feels like the psychic's just kind of leading them on with information that they could have found out before. That's just general knowledge of the case. Then the information gets more and more vague. They, you know, they drop off the psychic and the family is just a complete mess. Um, they're, you know, just emotionally wrecked and he is basically trying to console them, telling them this, this must have not been the right person for doing this, this type of work. Um, it's just, it's another instance, and I've heard of several now at, at this point where psychics have wound up hurting the families pretty badly um, in this way. They hired private investigators and hydrology experts, uh, employed bloodhounds, and followed advice of psychics. They outlasted several detectives and two police chiefs. They weren't doing anything, Jan said in an interview. We lost faith in every system we believed in. The book is called Footprints of Courage. Jan's speculation that an off-duty police officer whom she names in the book had Chris removed from the bar so he could hook up with Chris's girlfriend is another aspect that's covered there. And that's not a theory that I've heard a whole lot of, about here and um, really kind of grabbed my, my attention. Um, if we do go back to the original story and think of a situation of why someone might want to kick Chris out, uh, possibly, possibly there was something along those lines going on there. And if this is an off-duty police officer working as a bouncer, is he going to be able to influence things enough for this investigation to not go exactly smoothly? Um, I don't know. Something to certainly consider. Minneapolis Police Chief Tim Dolan says the Jenkins's anger is justified. Sometimes when officers make assumptions, it can bite you in the rear end. Uh, now, he was also interviewed on Breaking Homicide, and they asked him directly, what do you think is going on with this case? Like set percentages for us. Uh, what's the percentage that Chris ended his, his own life? And the chief put that at about 20%. He said, okay, well, what's the percentage that this is homicide? The chief said 50%, and then he left 30% for accidental. So it's a little strange to me to know that they came from, you know, what happened in 2006 and 2007, where it looks like they were trying to charge someone specifically for this. But then to hear the, the police chief interviewed, and I believe he was interviewed just last year, and he's saying, you know, 50% chance that that this is homicide, um, I don't know. I don't know. It, it really kind of struck me because I was already unsure. And even the two hosts of the show, they're pretty much at odds. One of them thinks it's homicide. One of them thinks it's an accident. Um, I really, I'm split right down the middle on this. And I'm also frustrated because I can't really come to any determination about what would be the next steps that you would take to, to process this further, to figure this out. Um, I wish that we had some information about the lividity on his body, the basically the blood pooling, because that could help us understand. You know, if the lividity was all on his back, then my theory that he was laying down somewhere when he died um, would make sense. And then he had to have possibly become frozen enough or possibly entered rigor mortis, then went into the water, then the water froze over while he was still in rigor. Because Part of the problem is his body, if it was really being moved by the current, especially something like the Mississippi River, there should have been something shown in terms of the clothing being moved or one of his limbs for his hands to remain in that position just really, really doesn't make sense. Um, then there's another interesting point that comes up in that show as well. Uh, in one of his hands, there were hair fibers that were found and apparently they were DNA tested. I can't find really solid news information on this. So I wasn't sure really how in depth to cover it with you guys, but um, they did cover it in the show as well. They came to the conclusion that it was his own hair that was found bunched up in one of his fists in his hand, um, which certainly raises a big question. What the heck's going on? He's literally not just going to grab a chunk of his hair and pull it out and 
Um, so I don't, I don't know what's going on with that aspect of the case either. Uh, the conclusions that they came to in breaking homicide, I'm really unsatisfied with as well. Uh, I know I watched a Kaylee Elise video on this that was done a couple years ago, and uh, they had some information that maybe the DNA testing wasn't done properly, so it could have been contaminated or something along those lines. Uh, I just, I didn't run into enough what I would consider solid information to report it to you guys. So, but I did want to let you know about that aspect that apparently some hair is found in his hand. I, I still can't tell you conclusively if it is his actual hair or not, except that it does seem that a DNA test was run on it that did say that it was his actual hair. But how would that have happened? I, I really have no idea. And let's just finish this up with some quotes from an unnamed officer. Uh, Families are psychologically prone to believe a loved one is the victim of foul play rather than an accident, said one officer who worked on the case. Do you now think Chris was murdered? I asked the officer who replied, I just don't know. And I think I'm with him. I really don't know either. Um, I was hoping to get to the end of this video and to kind of have things I could point to and say, okay, look. This, this, and this, and this, yes, this is certainly a homicide. They need to investigate this. But I'm kind of stuck at the same point that I was at at the beginning of this. When you know the basics of this case, the big question comes down to how is his body found in that position? Um, why is there hair in his hand? Why is all the clothing still intact? Why are both of his shoes on? I mean, practically nothing's missing from what we see in the picture of him at the party. Um, how does that happen? And four months of being undisturbed in that way? Uh, I guess in one way, we almost have to assume that he had to have been frozen over because uh, I, I did not see a whole lot of... Um, of his body being bothered by animals, which you would typically see, especially for someone that had been out there that long. So it seems to me like there's some mechanism by which, like I said, he must have died possibly on land, entered rigor mortis. I don't know if the water level raises or if something could have moved and he could have gotten into the water, but somehow he gets frosted over, enters the water, stays in a spot where it's cold enough that uh, he's essentially frozen until things start thawing out when we get to the end of the season. And then he breaks free with this tree and is located later. It's just, I don't know. I don't know what else to think. Um, what do you guys think? Is there something else at play here that I'm missing? I just, this is a really, really tough one. This, this is... It's, it's got me running kind of in both directions. I really feel strongly that it could be an accident, but then I've got these things where I'm like, no, it can't be an accident. So what is really happening here? I don't know. Let's talk about it in the comments down below. Uh, no comment review this week. I actually am running out of time today. I've got something I have to get to tonight, but we will continue that next week. My apologies. I hope each and every one of you has a nice Friday, a wonderful weekend, and I'll see you back here on Monday with a brand new case crack.